Welcome to our virtual space, where thought leaders who in a variety of ways have committed themselves to improving our lives, share their work, perspectives on current affairs, and what brought them to where they are today. My name is Rob Liu, and this is The Exchange. So Francesca, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today in The Exchange. Um, you have done an enormous amount of work in biostatistics, in data science, and you have also very recently helped so many of us understand the role that something like air pollution, which we would think is very distant from the COVID-19 pandemic, can actually intersect with the COVID-19 pandemic in some very serious ways. And so we'll have a chance to really go into that, which I think is truly groundbreaking and important work in public health. But before we get to that, I think one of the questions that our audience um, frequently has, especially for a scholar, for a researcher that does so many different things, you know, you're a statistician, you're a data scientist, you're a, a public health scientist as well, is in your own words, how would you sum up what you do, what you focus on? <laughs> oh, that's, that's a great question. Um... So I consider myself actually a director right now of an orchestra. And uh -huh. I am, yes, even though I know nothing about music and I'm not a musician, but when, I, when you ask me what I'm doing, I feel like I, I've been able to recruit that different members of the orchestra and each of them are actually absolutely talented and skilled on playing the different instruments. And the different instrument, I mean, the, the, um, the musicians are college students, master student, PhD student, postdoctoral fellows, and professional data scientists. And they're playing, and, and on top of that, they're playing, you know, different instruments. So they're the ones that are very mathematically oriented and they just do math. They're one that are just doing methodological work and causal inference. They're the one that are really interested in policy. And they're the one that are very interested in public health. So I love my work because what I do is I get ideas and then I put the orchestra together and you know have them play together because to me. Um, to do a high impact work and to do work that change the world, you have to have a full orchestra. You have to have the person, it's like, you know, playing a symphony, right? You can't play a symphony with just the piano. So you have to have people that are developing way to, for example, be able to uh, estimate counterfactual values for what the air pollution level would be under a different condition, right? And so you need to know time series, you need to know statistics, you need for, for, for forecasting, you need to know machine learning. But then you also have to know to have people that ask the question, why is this important? Why you're asking this question? And if we get all right, how are we gonna change policy? So I think, you know, I I basically try to direct an orchestra, listen to the symphony, figure out what instrument is missing, try to recruit the right instrument and just put it together. <laughs> and yeah. this just, just came up right now, try to uh, <laughs> ask your question. And sometimes we come up with a very nice music, sometimes not, but yeah. that's okay. Because also I feel what's really fun is that, which is different from playing a symphony, is that sometimes, and you understand that when you do like interdisciplinary collaboration, even if that particular project, so in that case, that particular symphony gets like it's terrible, it doesn't matter because the process of bringing these ideas together, it still has an enormous value. So there is a training and opening mind of thinking about science and by putting people with different talents together, even if for some time the end product is not perfect, but still the process is really important. Of course. And so you've spoken really convincingly about the power of bringing together these interdisciplinary perspectives. 
Now, because you are a co-director of the Harvard Data Science Initiative, and you do a lot with very large and complex data sets, is it fair to say, though, that for this orchestra, a lot of the music sits on sort of large scale data sets that are quite complex. That, that in some ways is one of the, the sort of common um, themes in the piece for the orchestra. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. I think that you know, the, the reason why uh, now we are in this new era of data science is that we have access to more rich and complex data that we didn't have before. So that open, uh, you know, all new opportunities that before we didn't have. But to me, uh, I, I often say that there is no data science without data and without a lot of data. And to me, actually, often I say, and this is what some people will not agree, there is no even science without data science. And although these days is different, there shouldn't be policy without science. So you yeah. see that ultimately what I like to do and what I feel very strongly is that relying on and leveraging this massive amount of data with all of the complication and the problem, to me is the first step to change the world in, in, you know, in a better place. Of course, it's not the only step, it's not the only way, but it's definitely one of the main ways. Yeah, fantastic. So one of the fascinating things about data science, I think, which is often the case with, I mean, in some ways, as, you, as you've pointed out, it is fundamental science, right? What is science without data, et cetera? But our understanding of data science around an interdisciplinary analysis of very large and complex data sets um, is a relatively recent growing sort of field. And what's quite often the case is that it's not as if many of the people that would now consider themselves data scientists um, were born data scientists or knew they were going to be data scientists in graduate school because that term didn't exist. So one question I have for you, when you think back over your past, and you, know, and it, and you can go way back to when you were a child or when you were in high school, in undergraduate or in graduate school, was there an experience that happened um, an event or a person that you encountered that you could point to and say, you know what, I'm doing what I'm doing today because of that, that event or that person. Is there something that you can point to that gives us insight into Francesca's pathway to where she is today? Yeah, no, sure. I think that, you know, when I was doing my, you know, I, I myself, it was interesting because both when David Parks, my colleague and the co-director of the Science Initiative, were asked to be together, the two co-directors, we both look at each other and said, I'm not a data scientist. <laughs> and he said, I'm not a data scientist either. <laughs> so yes, I mean, you know, we all, you know, he's a computer scientist and I'm a statistician. And then I think over time, we both realized and the potential of data science. but. So to address your question, you know, when I was back in Italy and also at the beginning of my training with PhD, that was all about theory and probability and, you know, just for, you know, very, very theoretical statistics and there was not much access to data at that time. And especially in Italy, the school where I was coming from is, was very strong in, a, in a theoretical Bayesian statistics. So I didn't have access to much data, um, which I regret. And I was finding, again, a little frustrating because I love the theory, but I, again, I, I wanted to change things. And actually, that's why I decided to take a course in statistics and not in mathematics, because mathematics was even more, more abstract. But um, after I finished my PhD, I... Um, you know, I was, just to give you a little bit of an history, I was a visiting scholar at uh, Duke University from Italy, and I finished my Italian PhD at Duke University. And then I, was, I decided to look for jobs in the United States. I was frustrated about the slow pace of research in, uh, in Italy. In a certain way, even though it was not clear to me, but I was frustrated about the lack of access to data and to important problems. So I, my first job was as a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Biostatistics with Scott Ziegler, which at that time is a um, highly regarded statistician 
he was the chair of the Department of Biostatistics. And that's how I got recruited to work on the on these air, air pollution project. It was the first air pollution project. And it was funny, uh, and it was lucky for me because my thesis, my PhD thesis was on uh, Bayesian hierarchical models, so to combine information from different data sources. And the project they have was that they have air pollution data and health data from different cities in the United States. And they wanted someone who was very strong in combining information and statistical approaches and combining information. And also, they were strong in propagating this different source of uncertainty. And so that was really what changed because I, you know, when I was hired, first of all, I knew nothing about air pollution, nothing about epidemiology, nothing about public health. I mean, I was just a statistician, you know, I've done a theoretical thesis in Bayesian statistics, but it really transformed me because I learned the power of um, rigorous statistical thinking when you're trying to address important question. And they basically, they, you know, I got right into probably what they had at that time, the first, and which was a hugely impactful study, is National Study on Air Pollution and Health. And so very quickly, I needed to reframe where I was not only doing the statistical analysis and the theory right, but do it in a way that it will be also changing um, changing environmental policy. And then honestly, I never came back. I mean, I never came back to all the theory without data. It changed my frame of mind. And so what how I like to work, I mean, every day in, in everything, it's first is what is the question? Is this the right question? And if we address the question, how are we gonna change the world? I mean, that's how high has to be the bar. And then you get the data and then you get the analysis done. But the opposite process of developing theory in abstract, I'm not saying it's not value, it's just something that doesn't um, interest me anymore. I mean, I really okay. like to get to the bottom of the problem. Of course. So you have mentioned, and I had mentioned it earlier, your work in terms of looking at air pollution, right? And the impact on sort of that form of environmental degradation on human health, but also, the geographic nature of this and how it relates to health disparities in a variety of ways. So Francesca, can you share with us some of the, the sort of your current thinking and what you're focusing on in terms of air pollution? And also, can you share some of the recent work that you've done that intersects with COVID-19 and the issue of pre-existing conditions? Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think in a nutshell, first of all, you know, going back to the point that there is not data science without data. And so um, after I finished my, my postdoctoral fellows, I realized that, again, the, um, the highest possible rigor in thinking, really you have to get the best possible data out there. So um, I invested a lot of time and resources writing grants to build what I consider the largest data platform in the United States that use air pollution data and link to health data for 60 million um, elderly in the United States. So we actually have individual linked electronic medical records for 97% of the population older than 65. We know where they live, we know age under the race, we know every single hospitalization and we know when they died. And so, you know, that is, a, you know, it's, it's, it's a data science lab. And I feel like if you really wanted to address a question that changed policy, you have to start from the data. So um, that's one element. The second element is the statistical thinking. So a lot of the work that we do is, of course, you know, the thing that I like about this topic is every single statistical challenges, every single statistical methodology has a place in the context of air pollution health. You have data that is messy, comes from different data sources, time varies in time and space, uh, uh, you have to propagate uncertainty, you have to do causal inference, you have to do machine learning to predict exposure. I mean, any statistical topic that you can think about, I'm pretty certain I can give you, you know, a way to apply it in this context. 
And so um, I think that we have done a lot of research, we are doing a lot of research in statistics and data science to really think about you know, how you best predict air pollution, how you estimate causal impact of air pollution, how you identify susceptibility to air pollution. And then it goes to the epidemiological study. And so in a nutshell, what we have done is, three years ago, we had one very influential study, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, where we have, uh, as I said, we, we follow 60 million Americans for over 15 years, and we found that they have an increased mortality risk, a level of fine particulate matter that were below the national ambient air quality standard. And so that was really a very strong, compelling evidence that will urge the EPA administration to lower the safety standard for their pollution. Now, this is a very controversial time, as we all know. Right now, the EPA is saying that it's not lowering the national ambient air quality standard. But of course, there is a strong pushback because the science, including our science two years ago, say exactly the opposite. They said, if you only take Americans that live in areas that breed levels of pollution below the standard, we still see an increase in mortality risk. So by law, they're supposed to lower the standards. The other interesting important funding for that study was that Afro-Americans experience a mortality risk associated with long-term exposure to fine particulate matter, they were three times higher than the national average, even after you account for socioeconomic status and comorbidity. And that's, it's really um, striking and, um, you know, disturbing to me. And I wanted to dig deeper and deeper into that. And so the second piece of evidence is we actually just finishing a manuscript which uh, shows that over time, and this is you know, sophisticated analysis of spatial temporal data, of course, for all the United States in the last 20 years. And we show that even though we are cleaning the air, so the levels of pollution in this country are going down, the level of inequities in, in, across socioeconomic status and across racial group in terms of who breathes high pollution level, who breathes low pollution level, actually has been increasing over time. What has been really shocking to me, and we're gonna report, we actually have the preprint is gonna come up tomorrow, is that you can see, like you can visualize that the areas in the, in the, in the country that have been benefiting cleaner hair, not surprising but disturbing are the areas where the rich lives and the white population lives, which then links to COVID. So when we started, unfortunately, when we were all in the lockdown, we're still in the lockdown, and my, my mind was, you know, I couldn't focus on anything else and thinking, how can I help and what we can do with all the data that we have and all the expertise? And so as I was reading about COVID-19, uh, I, I realized that a, that a lot of the deaths for COVID-19, and in a certain way, COVID-19 is a form of viral pneumonia. And so many people died for this, this what is called acute respiratory distress syndrome. Yeah. Now, three years ago, um, going back to the orchestra, one musician of the orchestra was a PhD student in environmental health um, mentored by David Cristiani, who is a professor and clinician at MGH, which is a very expert in acute respiratory distress syndrome. And three years ago, we actually published a paper showing that long-term exposure to fine particulate matter could increase the risk for, for that of acute respiratory distress syndrome. So I started to put this thing together. I said, well, I know there are pollution. We've done so much research penetrates deep in, into your lungs, creates all a sorts of inflammation, can kill you for acute respiratory distress syndrome. We know also at the same time, we were learning that Afro-Americans were experiencing much higher rate of mortality for COVID-19. We know that Afro-Americans are also breathing higher level of fine particulate matter. Clearly, the, the whole picture is much more complicated than this, but these were all of the different pieces of the puzzle that then uh, led me to say, well, let's look at the data that we have and see whether 
if you live in areas where you have long-term exposure to fine particulate matter, if you have been breathing this pollution for a very long time, you are more vulnerable to die from COVID-19. And so this, you know, this is a preliminary study, has a ton of limitation because this is an ecological study. And so it's been criticized for that, which I totally agree. And you know, one of the challenges that, so what we did is we had all of the data on the levels of air pollution. We had very sophisticated machine learning model that estimated levels of air pollution in the last 20 years for every one kilometer, one kilometer grid in the United States. We have socioeconomic status, we have sophisticated methods for causal inference, we have all that. The problem is COVID-19 data for the whole country is only available at the county level. So at every day, we only know the total number of deaths for COVID-19. We do not have yet um, a nationwide electronic medical record registry for COVID-19. So that's why the only thing we could do, but I felt it was important to look at it, was to uh, do what we call the ecological regression analysis. So try to assess whether counties that have a um, higher level of air pollution in the, you know, for, during the last 20 years were experiencing higher rate of COVID-19 mortality. Clearly, we adjusted and we did actually a lot of complex statistical adjustment because you know, of course, you can not only look at the correlation, you could have the county of high pollution also have a high COVID-19 mortality rate because these are counties that have higher population density, right? right. So um, in the model, we account for um, po population density, for the age structure of the population, all kinds of socioeconomic status, the stage of the pandemics. And so we found the strongest statistical significant relationship. Now, you know, I think I will consider this study as very preliminary. I think that clearly there are a lot of limitations with ecological regression. We all know that. And so what we're doing now is um, now different states and different counties have more access to more individual level covariate. And so it goes back to the power of data science and combining information is how now can you access to individual level data to correct for the potential ecological bias that comes from the study. The other thing which, which is very interesting is that when we post our paper, we did we post all of the data and all of the code there. Because I felt, yes, it's preliminary, it's an ecological regression, but look, this is exactly what we did. And you know, at least I felt we share with you exactly how we thought about the data. And it's been really, actually, this has been for me, it goes back to the, to the orchestra and why the process is important. Because now that, that code has been downloaded from all around the world, different country, and they're looking at their own data and they're using similar statistical model to analyze their data with our code. And, you know, of course, some of them make some changes, but then we have some, sign, some type of like same comparison, right? And so yeah. yesterday, for example, um, there was a nice article on The Guardian where there is now a new study released in the Netherlands. And they have, it's also an ecological regression analysis, but that's, it's much, it's better because their, their county, <laughs> it's 10 kilometers, 10 kilometers, right? So it's much more smaller. And so they actually found a strong effect of our pollution and they use the same, the same statistical approaches. So I felt what's rewarding is that there is now, and this is a rapidly evolving research area that different people around the world are looking at it. And they, you know, um, many are using our own, uh, our same statistical models. M many are building on it, which is great. Um, so that's, you know, that's basically what, what we did and what we found, and it's having, um, actually to me, like, kind of like a strong impact because as the APA is trying to say, we are not, we don't want to reduce the national metric quality standard for, for fine particulate matter, there is now this emerging evidence that is saying, well, fine particulate matter could make COVID-19 worse. Yes. So do you think that is a wise decision? Yes. So, I mean, clearly this is a major contribution to the continued unpacking of health disparities. 
and what they might be based on. I think in some ways this also underscores what for many is a surprise. There is a sense that neighborhoods are different, right? Based on that, even within the same city, that the um, density is different. The number of individuals in a single housing unit is different. Maybe exposure to lead paint can be quite different from one neighborhood to another tied with um, socioeconomic status. I think what was not so clear, I think perhaps until now, is that the air can be different. Because I think there's often the sense with air pollution, it's a very large, gross phenomenon. So that you have an air pollution problem, if you will, in a city, in a whole country, for example. But I don't think people realize, and I think your work underscores this, is that air pollution can be quite variable. Oh, yeah. Right, from neighborhood to neighborhood. Huge. Yeah. Huge. And actually, this is how data science has helped us, because the last three years, and they, again, you know, this is not all my work, and, and I should, you know, really credit my colleague, Joel, Joel Schwartz, who is on the School of Public Health. So well, what he did is he actually has been uh, leading a team that used um, machine learning to predict levels of pollution at much lo more local level. And again, this is a perfect study of data science because what they do is they take data from satellite and satellite data gave a measure of aerosol optical depth. So it's an imprecise measure of air pollution, but it's daily a one kilometer, one kilometer grid. So they take that data, they take weather data, and they take output from atmospheric chemistry models so that actually developed from Daniel Jacob team at the School of Engineer Applied Science as the input of a machine learning model that then give you very accurate prediction of levels of air pollution at the very small spatial resolution. And so, um, you know, you can look at our maps, but they're everywhere. There are tremendous changes in levels of air pollution. So if even if you think about, you know, in, in, the, in the Boston area, if you right. compare Chelsea and Dorchester, it's very different pollution level than Cambridge and Brookline. Why? Because unfortunately, people have lower socioeconomic status, live closer to highways. They have less ability to fight against building a power plants. And, and so there are more local, Sources. It, it, what we are saying, though, Rob, is also true that PM 2.5 can travel very far, right? So it's definitely true that if there is a power plant in Dorchester, you can bring the levels of fine particulate matter in, um, you know, even even from 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 far away. But yeah. uh, this community, and it's also many factors, right? So it's lead, it's exposure to more allergen is having less access to healthcare, is more pollution. I mean, it's all of that together. But try yeah. to disentangle the fact of our pollution is important because that's where the regulation should be happening. Yes. So it's, I mean, I think something you've raised time and time again now in our conversation is the importance of these um, multiple sources of data, right? And trying to overlay them and get them to work together in terms of understanding what can be drawn from them. Um, have you seen the um, data set, I think, that was released by Walgreens? No. On, um, on pre-existing conditions? I'll send you the paper. I came across it last week. Yes. It's very interesting, right? Because they're very interesting in pre-existing conditions. Yeah. And it was funny, I was, um, so I'm teaching a class right now, and I challenged my students, if you're interested in how these pre-existing conditions might affect your risk, in terms, of, um, in terms of mortality due to COVID-19, how would you get a single data set across the United States, county by county, where would that come from? And so many of the students were talking about, you know, getting it from the hospitals and trying to pool it based on cases they're seeing, et cetera, based on the medical records of the, of the folks that they've seen. And to me, what impressed me with this is that who has the data? but a company. Yeah. So Walgreens, they released, I think, de-identified data on 30 plus million individuals across the United States with drug prescriptions for, I believe, three of the pre-existing conditions. And they have done a calculation on 
county by county, that X out of a thousand are presenting with at least one pre-existing condition that would be a cause of concern. So uh, yeah, Francesca, let me say that. I mean, I don't know how good yeah. the data is, yeah. but it sounds like as a 30 million people across the entire United wow. States, yeah. to me, it would be interesting to overlay it yeah. with your data, right? Yeah. Looking at air quality and to see how the drug prescriptions actually yeah. overlay on that. Yeah. I mean, that would be very interesting. No, fast. So, oh, please do. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's kind of an example yeah. of how from different sources. And of course, you know, of course, I have to admit, I, I have a reflex, right? It's sort of like, oh, it's Walgreens. It's a for-profit commercial thing. But, but when you really think about it, they have data. Right. Yeah. Serious data. Right. So anyway, I will I will send it to you because I think you might find it. Oh, I mean, I'm, I was really struck by it, oh. and so they they've developed a map yeah. right across you know county by county across the United States. But um, but so clearly this is a moment in time where we can see in the face of COVID nineteen, yeah. how collecting data, being able to analyze it with an orchestra that is interdisciplinary is so 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 important. Yeah. Um, it does seem as if one of the problems that I seem to keep sort of running into is the fact that we are not actually in the United States as consistently collecting data at the federal level as we could. I mean, that's my impression. Do you have the same impression, Francesca? Yeah, no, it's it's a total disaster. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disaster. So. The reason why I've been investing all of the resources and time on Medicare data is again, even though by no means it's perfect, is the only type of national health insurance that we have, right? So it's collects billing claims. And so for many things, you know, we have been making a huge contribution using this Medicare data. But unfortunately, our country, first of all, because we don't have a national wide health insurance. And so clearly, you know, with respect to count to other countries like, you know, Europe, um, we are, you know, immediately very impaired about that. And even, I mean, even in Boston, even if I want to access data through the Harvard affiliated hospital, even if I go as a director of the data science initiative and say, can we put together a registered attorney medical record on COVID. I mean, it would be a nightmare. I mean, I cannot, I cannot access as a faculty member of the School of Public Health. I cannot access a attorney medical record from the Brigham, right? So, uh, and then on top of that, unfortunately, we are in a situation where different states and the different Department of Health of different states have different resources and ability to collect the COVID nineteen data. So, with COVID nineteen, is even worse, right? So, I mean, I have to say, I, I was so impressed by the effort made by the Johns Hopkins University where yes. they had the, the platform. I mean, tremendous. just think about the amount of information and knowledge that we have been able to have thanks to their initiative. And, they, you know, it goes back I, to me, that what I consider the most impactful, the most impactful contribution of data science is that you have a problem, you have a pandemic, you have a crisis, you don't have a government that act responsibly to, to gather the data, you build what you can to make this data available to everybody. And, it, and that's, I think, what's actually data science, I consider an, an intellectual element. So by the exercise of combining, gathering, scraping, harmonizing the data, like Johns Hopkins did, to me is a world-class data science uh, because yes. it's enabling then everybody to model, to understand, to compare, to inform, right? And so um, this is something that data scientists haven't thought about and sometimes people don't think about data science and sometimes this type of work is considered not you know, valuable as new methodology, but to me, think about where we will be without that, you know, um, yes. contribution. So I think in the, in the United States, because of the highly decentralized nature, because of the current political environment, 
And because we don't have, we have a very uneven skill in public health across different states, make the access to data very, uh, very challenging. And there are so many efforts, so I hope it will get better. But I do think that at the same time, with the, you know, with the caution, I do think that we should try to make the best use that we can with the data that we have access to. Of course, of course. So I think one thing you have throughout this argued so persuasively for, and I think you illustrate this yourself, is the degree to which data science is an action-oriented research field. Yeah. That it's about action, it's about problem solving. It's about looking at a challenge or an issue and unpacking it and trying to make things better. And you said yourself time and time again how you really started to, to move towards this because of your interest in you know, you appreciated theory and the beauty of theory, but that you really wanted to, apply, you wanted to have impact, right? You, you really wanted to have impact. So, I mean, I think that's abundantly clear and all of the work that you're doing certainly speaks to that. Now, let me ask you another question though that is quite different because I wanna give our viewers and listeners sort of a little bit of an insight into Francesca from a different angle. When you're not doing data science, when you're not wrangling complex data sets, when you're not figuring out sort of the machine learning algorithms that you need, what does Francesca do for fun? <laughs> oh boy, well, um, I have to say, I am a little bit of a sports nut. Ah, so okay. I, um, yeah, I, I, run, I, run many, I run many marathons and now I'm yes. training for an half Ironman. So I run, swim, bike. I'm, I'm a little bit of it. So I actually, I value, I protect my own time. I, my mind cannot work the way I want it to 10 hours a day. I don't think no one can. And, and so um, I have two, two to three hours a day, very early in the morning where I just train. I have a coach. And so oh, I spend a lot of time outside training. And then, of course, you know, my family um, and um, it's actually the, I kind of enjoy it. And, I, you know, I feel guilty because we've been, you know, I feel so privileged. You know, we can work from home and we've been whole healthy and I've been really enjoying spending actually more time with my husband and my daughter who's 14. And then I have two dogs, which are also a passion of mine. I have a Labrador two black Labrador, one oh, is wow. two years old, and the second one is a puppy. I got her just a week, no, no, three weeks ago. Oh, goodness. Okay. So, yeah, she's, she barks. She starts barking at five in the morning. <laughs> That's not very fun. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I feel like above and beyond, um, you know, I mean, everyone manages their time differently, but um, I am, when I work, I work very intensively and yes. I don't waste time in front of the computer if my mind doesn't go at the speed it has to be, so I do something else. Um, well, so, yeah. yeah. So, I think that sounds so healthy <laughs> and so balanced because I'm sure with the work that you do, you could do nothing but work. Yeah. And I'm sure that you have colleagues we all have colleagues that that's all they do, yeah. right? All they do is work. They don't take time for, for anything else. And I, I remember something I learned in graduate school where the expectation was that you were in lab. If you weren't sleeping, you were in lab. That was what you were supposed to be doing. And what I learned, I think, halfway through graduate school is that, you know, that's the expectation. Everyone's in lab. It's like midnight in lab and the whole lab is in there. Um, but then what I started to realize is that, you know, the graduate students and postdocs that had families that had to go home were actually way more efficient. Mm -hmm. And the ones that were not married, that didn't have families, that spent their entire life, including myself, in lab, what I suddenly realized was that I became very inefficient. Yeah. You, because you sort of stretch everything out to fill these, you know, 16 hour days, right? right. And it, it just doesn't work. Well, yeah. and you idolize that actually after having a child, because then you have a very specific time windows where you have to get yes. things done. And so 
But um, I also feel that, um, you know, as a person which has a leadership position, I think how I interact with people, I think is really important. Yes. And um, sometimes actually I, frust I'm, I get frustrated that this is not value enough, I think, in the very high academic center. I think that, you know, if I am balanced with myself and I, sle I sleep and I always approach every meeting, even the most difficult one, doesn't matter if it's with a student or with the provost, with a smile and a positive attitude. And to me, when you are in a leadership position, this is your responsibility because if you have a meeting where you're really cranky, you can make a lot of damage, right? You can. Yes. And so, um, you know, this happened to everybody. What happened to me, which I experienced before, and I, you know, it's like you work all the time and then you get cranky. And then you yes. have the meeting where you snap out or you are impatient or, you know, and you... And, and I think especially now that everything is on Zoom and people are feeling, I feel like I need to take care of me to take care of others. Of course. And so um, sports, it really like, you know, after, after I, I swim around for an hour, you can do anything to me. I have a good <laughs> smile, I'm okay, we're gonna be good. But yeah, I think that's, um, and I don't want it to send the message that good science is 24 seven, because I really don't think that we could have good, good ideas if you don't sleep, eat and exercise. Anyway, that's no, my viewpoint. <laughs> of course, of course. So let me ask you a related question. We talked earlier about sort of, you know, events, people that you felt, you know what, that was really important for me ending up where I am today. I think for all of us, throughout your life, you come to a crossroads and you go left instead of right, or you go right instead of left. And that choice has major ramifications for you. So what's interesting, and, and, and it's the question that I have for you, thinking about one of those crossroads, let's say, where you went left instead of right. Yeah. In a multiverse, in an alternative universe, if you had gone right, would the Francesca I'm talking to today be doing something very different? Yeah. <laughs> it's a tough question. It's a tough it's question. Tough. I mean, I think, um, uh, yes, I mean, I think there have been opportunities. So I moved to Harvard in 2010 when I was already a full professor at Hopkins. And I think that, um, you know, it was kind of interesting thinking about the, you know, the different road. I could um, get very comfortable, um, you know, either a Hopkins on another institution, um, you know, just doing what I was doing and yeah. be, be comfortable. You know, I was tenure and for professor, whatever, right? Or, come to Harvard and go back to be the, the last kid on the block, right? Because this is what Harvard is, right? We all know yeah. that. Like, you're, you know, you're an associate professor at Harvard, you can be a dean, right? <laughs> and so reinvent, I had to, you know, I have to re literally, you know, reinvent, no, it's not really reinvent myself, but go back to and be, honestly, to be an assistant professor, right? Going from being all established and I could just like cruise it through and, yeah. you know, or come, come, and I think, you know, I, sometime, um, I don't know if I would abstain in a comfortable, I, I just, just because of, of my nature and the energy I have, I, I, you know, I don't like to be comfortable for too long. If I, this is why, you know, I run marathons and then when I run marathons, I have to do a triathlon because I know how to run a marathon. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, I, I think that was, that was the, the difference. And I love Harvard, um, even though sometimes Harvard drives me nuts. But I love Harvard because of that. You always have the opportunity to uh, reinvent yourself. And even if you think you're really good, there are going to be another 100, 200 people around the block that are better than you. And so you have to face that. And I think, you know, the 
working with the relationship with Debbie Parks has been really wonderful. It's like, you know, we work together very, very closely. We were asked to do that. And then we look at each other and say, okay, we're going to do it or no, it's fine. And I think it's been, I learned a ton working with, with David and I admire him so much. And so I think also that's interesting where there is so much to gain in building a very strong professional relationship and leading a university wide initiative with all of the political and you know the, all of the type of things so with, with, with someone else. Um, yes. So yes. yeah, I think you know, I could have been comfortable doing what I was doing or I decided to, to and one thing I, I repeat myself all the time is to say to embrace to be uncomfortable because if you become comfortable of being uncomfortable, that's actually how you grow you know, professionally and personally. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I think that's, that was, I mean, I think in 2010, when I moved to Harvard was probably a really, you know, big change point about which, which path uh, mm -hmm. I wanted yeah. to take. Yeah. Well, of course I can see that. So I think, you know, going back to the sports metaphor with marathons and triathlons, et cetera, it's, it sounds to me as if you're one of those people where you also run a hurdle where, in fact, you get energy from getting over hurdles, yeah. right? Because I think, you know, we both know that no matter where you are, there are always structures, systems, the way things are done that kind of can get in the way. Yeah. And so, I, you know, I suspect that you get energy from pushing against that yeah. and in some ways trying to solve those issues, right, to get something done. Yeah, and at the same time, you also learn to be resilient and yes. to be able to face failure, right? When, when I didn't know how to swim at all three years ago, and the first time I got into a lake, it lasted two seconds, and I said, yeah, you know, I'm not going to do that ever again. Right. So I think, yeah, I think to me, the most important piece, which I learned and I like to share with others is to build the resiliency that you need that is so important in academia about you know understanding and facing rejection and criticism all of the time and that that is part of of learning and always important to say okay i fail why i fail and how i'm now going to do better so then i'm not going to fail again with understanding that failure is part of the game in a certain way. Very well said. So Francesca, I mean, thank you so much for spending this time with us. I think that for our viewers and listeners, you have really given enormous insight into how data science is actually not just helping us understand and hopefully address the COVID-19 pandemic, but that more broadly, how it allows us to unpack at scale both problems and at the same time allows us to think about solutions to those problems, especially in the areas of human health, of public health. So thank you so much for joining us in The Exchange. Thank you, my pleasure.